cover. So go ahead. Okay. And so, uh, first of all, the study, the, the Association of Washington Counties have always wondered as we go forward uh, exactly what the impacts of different things would be uh, on those of us that have timberland, those of us counties that have uh, timberland. And again, there are two categories of timberland one, one should remember in counties. One is that came from uh, statehood, which are 16 and 36 sections typically. And the other is that which came about because of uh, foreclosure back in the 20s and 30s. 30s. So, and again, what was the impact? We, Washington counties, there are 22 of us, if I recall correctly, out of the 39 counties wanted to see that, not only that impact, but also have a model that if there were further issues that came up, we could evaluate what the financial impact would be. So uh, that was the impetus of this. The study, we interviewed uh, consultants, uh, including Mace, Bruce, and Gerard, and two others. Also wanted to look at the other, quote, ecosystem benefits or costs that went, might be involved. And that part of the uh, study was performed by Highland Economics. So uh, that's just as quick background. And final, there are two members from WASAC that sat in the study. I was one of those. There were, the, the DNR certainly was involved. Uh, WFPA was involved. Uh, the environmental community also had uh, uh, individuals in the study so that we pretty much tried to cover the gamut and obviously it gets very technical. I'm trying to avoid some of that if we can, but uh, we'll, uh, uh, and so, so everyone do not hesitate to let me know if, if I'm not clear. Uh, go to page uh, two, if you don't mind, Colleen. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll review the findings fairly quickly and then we'll talk about questions. Next one, please. These were the questions we wanted or desired to have answered when we got through. What are the impacts of decisions made to provide habitat for marble marillettes? How are those impacts distributed between counties and taxing districts? Um, and let me just stop there. I, we didn't really know, and I don't know if everyone understands what I'm, when I talk about taxing districts and how it affects, if timberland happens to reside within a taxing district, when, the, when it's harvested, certain amount of that timber goes to those uh, entities that are in the taxing district. In SQUIM, it'd be the SQUIM school district. Uh, certainly a little bit also comes to the county 10 or 12%, some goes to roads. Some across the board goes to hospital districts and or other things, uh, to the fire districts, everything else. And so they're dis disproportionate kinds of, uh, of uh, economic uh, liabilities uh, in this case for depending on where you're located. And then um, how did the impacts change in the 2019 Habitat Conservation Plan for Marble Marillette Home? Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> First of all, the 1997 interim plan was implemented by the then Lands Commissioner, I think her name was Jennifer Belcher, uh, and there were about 600,000 acres in this uh, habitat conservation uh, plan, and as I mentioned, uh, please remember on the DNR of 1.4 million, 600,000 acres are already set aside, I think I said that, but it's important to remember we've already set aside areas to protect, uh, obviously, fish, uh, spotted owls with another one. So the marble marillette was a new, new entry into the realm of endangered species to think about. And when they set out the HCP in 1997, that uh, they had an interim strategy which took 33,000 acres. The 2019 HCP added, uh, and there are many, many alternatives they looked at, uh, and it added 4,000 additional acres. Next slide. Again, our project objectives, what are the financial impact and economic impacts and other impacts? And we'll certainly talk about some of the other impacts when we get there. Next slide. So where did our data come from? The, we utilized the DNR's um, 
inventory system. So we got information about, uh, you know, what trees are where. We did not redo that. We recognized that in our inventory system, as far as people actually setting boots on the ground, was last uh, inventoried um, in, I think, 19... 94, if I recall, sometime back there. And, and they've updated it by taking aerial photos and doing some sampling, but they haven't had a complete re-inventory, but of course that's the best information we have. The partner of revenue, of course, uh, and working with our county assessors about junior taxing districts and everything else. Um, we were talking about the impacts exclusively for the marble Marillette in this whole study. And then we wanted to, to the best we could, uh, calculate the contribution to the average annual long-term harvest, uh, stunt, stumpage revenue, harvest tax, employment, and income. Next slide. Um, Randy, can you explain the difference between the harvest, stumpage revenue, harvest tax, those three? Yeah, so, so let, let's just go back. So um, when one harvest timber on private land, public land, wherever, there's a calculation made that um, uh, calculates the tax and it's 4% of uh, the revenue, it's not of sales dollars, of what they call stumpage or the value of the trees on the stump. And that's, that's part of what we're talking about. So that occurs. What also occurs is of course, uh, uh, depending on what kind of land you have, uh, we share in the revenues, um, and we'll come to that in a, a little bit later, which, which is that um, if it's on what I call those foreclosed lands for, or uh, uh, that the DNR manages, the revenues distributed with 75% of it going to the counties. County means not only the county, but mostly to all the junior taxing rep districts, and 25% to the um, to the DNR for their management fee. And um, in the case of the other lands or came from statehood, none of that land or none of that revenue goes to the 4% still comes to the county, but the balance of the revenue goes to the, the state for, for school funding or their capital fund. So. Okay. Um, the second part of this is just uh, DNR distribution to counties. Quickly, you can look at, at that 53 million overall. Obviously, Marble Marillette uh, conservation, 97 versus 2019, not that different. Remember, we the ultimate delta between the two is 4,000 acres, basically. Um, uh, next slide. I won't go into this slide. It's what's in, what's not, what was the Delta. Obviously got to be very technical. Next slide, please. This, this is the counting framework as they call it um, for county level impacts. So the interim strategy, that's the 1997 strategy uh, had the federal, federal land grant lands, which are, again, the 16 and 36 mostly. Uh, so straight state forest transfer lands, those are the lands that, again, came to the DNR through uh, tax foreclosure. And there is a miscellaneous thing called state forest purchase, which doesn't matter. And again, you see the harvest tax, 4% uh, straight down the board. You see the interim strategy versus the 2019 strategy of what kinds of lands were involved in marble Maryland set aside. Then the county share from the harvest, that's an important number because that's how much goes directly into the coffers of the county. Again, that 75% comes into the county and gets distributed to all the junior taxing districts, et cetera. So um, next so slide. Randy, why yeah. is it that uh, for federal grant lands, counties don't receive any revenues from that. Or I guess they receive 4% harvest tax, but they don't receive any of the revenues for those harvests. Again, the, the, uh, when, the, when the, we became a state and the federal uh, government granted again in 
every township we had the sections uh, township range to get down to the sections and what was allocated were were 1636 and those were to go for a special purpose to go in the state coffers to be managed and of course out of those state coffers are, are where the money gets for school capital projects mm -hmm. okay, okay. And it, came, it came from the land grant status as versus when we foreclosed we the county foreclosed back in the 20s and 30s that those lands obviously came back to the county were then uh, put into the green market manage for for the benefit of the county and that's why we have the difference in sharing of revenue so any other questions thank you so basically federal grant lands fund schools generally for capital projects Ooh. and then state forest transfer lands we're interested in because that is DNR managing those lands on behalf of the counties that the lands are located That's in. Right. And it goes, whatever's harvested for a year when we receive revenue and we review it every quarter, when we receive that revenue, obviously it comes into our treasure and let's just be hypothetical and it was a harvest unit was here in Port Angeles. So, Part of it goes, of course, to the library district. Part of it goes to the hospital district. Part of it goes to fire district two. Part of it goes to, and you get the idea, all the junior taxing district. Part of it goes to the pool, for that matter. About 13% of it goes directly to the county of those revenues harvested in Port Angeles. So depending on where the harvest occurs is how that revenue flows into that taxing district and then gets distributed to each one of the junior taxing districts in the county. Any anything else? Nope. Thank you. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, th this is an important thing, and somewhat highlighted by is, uh, by what you said, Colleen. Uh, if you look over the left. Um, you see Jefferson County, most of the impact is on federal uh, grant lands and therefore no revenue share. So if you look down at, at their total acres, which are very similar to Guam County, but because of the mix of acres, federal grant lands versus state uh, forest transfer land, uh, the impact on one county can be quite significant vis-a-vis -vis another county and I just uh, that's real important and certainly and for some of the counties when you look at say Pacific County uh, which is a relatively small county doesn't have a great wonderful tax base of course um, that that becomes very significant um, so uh, this is then the 37,000 acres that the habitat conservation amendment of 2019 this is where all those lands are located within the different counties. Correct. Okay. And it's not only where they're located, but also are they federal grant lands or are they state forest board transfer lands? Okay. That also matters. Okay. Obviously Thank you. from a revenue standpoint. Hopefully I'm not getting too far in the weeds here. Um, next slide. I don't see any other questions, so. I get it so far. Yeah, Matt said it, it supports other other folks besides schools, obviously, and and that's absolutely correct. Um, the next one up is, is on the. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Are we okay? Yes, I'm trying to mute people there that might be causing that. On, on the left, the important thing here is uh, the methodology that, that Mason, Bruce, and Gerard did. Again, they've been a force consulting company for you know 75 years plus. Um, we're looking at 37,000 acres that, again, could produce 21 million 
board feet per year, earning 6.6 .6 million stumpage per year, and the counties would get the associated revenue. So, and, and the important thing here, when one looks at that, and we, as we continue down this list of, of or when we continue through the other slides, uh, the fact that Clallam County, of course, is the most impacted county of any county uh, of all the timber counties, I guess is the way to say it. So um, again, acres impacted, 11,000, um, every annual harvest, stumpage revenue, there's a uh, share of our harvest tax, et cetera, et cetera. So you see the total financial impact. And uh, again, the highlight here is, is um, the fact that uh, obviously we're the county that gets in, impacted more than anyone else. And, and that's not really totally surprising because we're also the largest timber county. Um, next slide. And it, does it make sense that we're the largest county with timber lands within 50 miles of the ocean? Uh, yes, obviously. Um, okay. Okay. And so there's only 11, didn't you say there were 22 timber counties, but there's only 11 listed here. So that's because there's only 11 that have areas in the 2019 amendment habitat conservation plan for the marble merlet. Well, and again, you know, it, it depends. I mean, a lot of counties timber land, uh, when you look at, at uh, Lewis County, and I, I haven't thought about it, I haven't drawn a, a line from the ocean to Lewis County, but uh, much of their timber land, of course, are, are up in the Cascades or Cascade region. So they're going to be less impacted than someone anywhere along the coast. And again, Clown County is entirely along the coast almost. So uh, mm -hmm. again, that's not a surprise either. And I don't know that everybody knows what MBF means. Oh, thousands of board feet log scale. That's a measurement of, of logs. Um, OK. So basically, the bottom line there is Clallam County is a little less than half of the total uh, economic financial impact to all the counties. Correct. OK. Next slide, and this kind of highlights highlights it for us. And, and again, in fairness, I certainly I when you talk to the county commissioners in like Pacific County, um, you know, um, the revenue may not be as large as what our county has, but of course, it's a much smaller county, therefore, can be a, a relatively large effect on a, a smaller timber county like Pacific County. So. Um, County share of revenue accounts for 83% of total financial impact. And of course, again, in this particular slide, uh, we're 51% of the total financial impact. So, um, And this has been ongoing since 2019 or 1997? 1997 was when the first HCP came in place and they set aside some specific areas for Marble Merillette. Uh, this was the final marble mirrorlet strategy instead of an interim strategy. And so what happened from as they went from 1997 through today is um, um, they added ended up adding about 4,000 additional acres under this current uh, final plan for the marble mirrorlet. So is it fair that, I mean, did they move those acres or did they just add another 4,000? So could you say that this was, um, you know, generally the case going back to 1997, that these are the areas that had not been harvested? Like, so Clallam County had half of the acres set aside since 1997? Yes, I, I, you know, it, it's, you know, you're talking about 4,000 acres, mind you, if, if I owned them, that would be a lot of, lot of uh, acres, but um, uh, the interim strategy, the final strategy, certainly they changed acres, I mean, where they're located in some places, because of the timber, as I said, because of the timber type and some other things, you know, so some areas were deleted, some areas were added, and the net change overall really didn't affect the county, the, our county, that much from 1997 to today, um, but again, it was uh, 
you know, um, and so we've been undergoing the effects of that and, you know, uh, as well as some other issues. Uh, and I would like to stress one other thing while we're here. It, it, and Colleen, I say that in light of people looking to make investments, say, in the timber <laughs> business. And if you think about the original harvest levels, which were obviously uh, uh, defined so that they would be uh, kind of a level flow over time, well, they continued to decline over this period from 650 million feet to the new projected numbers of about 450 million feet. Not only is that a direct effect on all the timber counties, but would you make an investment when your raw material is continued to decline and has continued over time because of this change drops the harvest level to a certain amount. Oh, we've got another change. This drops a, a level again. Oh, we have another change. This drops a level again. And I say that in light of the fact, obviously, I used to be a company that owned a, a sawmill here. It was a very specialized sawmill that was uh, that made um, uh, beams for Japan. We were the largest supplier of uh, Douglas fir beams to Japan. They were uh, special beams. I can tell you over the period that we owned it, we, we improved the pro productivity. It was a very unproductive mill when we bought out of bankruptcy, we improved the pro productivity by about uh, fourfold. We dropped our variable cost except for wood by, by uh, almost 50%. Our quality control increased. All those things sound really good. But if in fact, someone suddenly changes your harvest pattern, so you can't have that, a, would you make an investment? Or B, in our case, because the wood wasn't available in our local area, you end up either going to Canada or down to Oregon or some other place to harvest the wood. And so it, it just creates a, 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 an overall thought process of why do I want to make an investment in something when the supply of wood is, is so variable? In our case, the DNR <laughs> dropped their harvest two years in a row by a considerable amount, and that caused... Uh, deep distress to, to everyone and being honest when we got through with that you know unfortunately those are 37 w good paying jobs that suddenly weren't here and that's just a terrible thing but that's exactly what happened so again uh, stability of harvest level in my mind is very very important certainly if someone's looking to make an investment and uh, and you understand that well Colleen from an economic development standpoint so so this uh, slide is labeled interim strategy. So does that reflect 1997 or 2019? That's 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 the 1997. If you go to the next one, let me see if I, uh, yeah, oh, keep going. Okay. Here's the HCP yeah. amendment. See, there you go. Okay. I think that last slide, though, was interesting, showing the breakout for our county. Oh, it is. Um, and again, the, the change when you, when you look at it overall, who does it affect taxing district with the larger share of impacts? Schools, county roads, the general fund for the county, the fire districts. Again, it affects everyone um, who's in each one of those taxing districts where the timber is harvested, so. Mm -hmm. um, keep going now. And again, this is very similar to the prior one. Uh, you wouldn't expect to see, there were some changes in counties. Uh, there are some, some counties benefited as they moved acres around. <laughs> Some counties, uh, um, yeah. And some counties, uh, again, actually ended up with a, a better outcome than, um, than uh, what they had before from the interim strategy. Um, but again, the major county that is impacted by all these, uh, 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 or impacted by the HCP, both the uh, Interim and the final is, of course, still Collin County. Keep going. So one question that I didn't see in these slides when I perused through them quickly was that there apparently are 
four counties that receive a million dollars per year and have been receiving a million dollars per year for the last eight years because of a habitat conservation plan impacts to their county, but we're not part of that because we're too large of a county. Is that right? Or could you speak to that or someone else hey, that might uh, have some information? I don't have the history of someone like Matt might, or, or maybe Bruce Beckett would, but I don't know that. Colleen, I think you're talking about the, um, and, and I think Matt Comiskey is on here. I think you're talking about the, the funding that the legislature has provided to counties in Southwest Washington that were re really hit in the original HCP and the carryover of the lands being set aside uh, across, I think a specific Wakayakum and uh, maybe Skamania County. So is, is Matt on? Yes, yeah, Bruce, you, you nailed it. Um, those three counties traditionally have experienced a significant amount of DNR trust land revenue uh, flowing into their budgets. And about eight years ago, the legislature created a program. It's called the State Forest Transfer Replacement Program, I believe is the title. We, we call it the encumbered lands. Basically every biennium, the uh, state legislature appropriates money out of the capital budget uh, to buy endangered species encumbered county trust lands in those three counties out of trust status. Most of the money goes into the operating budgets of the counties. A small percentage goes to replace land. Um, and I've been working with uh, WASDA, the three counties, Columbia Land Trust, OSPI, to try to come up with a longer term solution. And we have a, a pilot project that we're trying to get funded, um, but it's only open to counties with a limited population. So those three counties and Klickitat County, which has not participated, is also eligible. So my question about that, Matt, so is that, is that, hold on, yeah, we go. My question is that you, you say they have been impacted, Pacific, Wakayakum, and Skamania counties, but just looking at this, and if you go back to the interim strategy that was in effect since 2000, uh, oops, sorry, wrong way. Uh, this one since 2000, or 1997, it seems like, well, we're the most impacted and yet we're not included in that. Yeah, um, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I just was gonna say, yeah, when you look at it um, as far as gross numbers, you are correct because Clallam County is the largest uh, timber county of DNR trust lands on the west side, but when you look at it as a percentage of their county budget, um, you will see Wakayakum, Pacific, and Skamania rising higher to, if, if you looked at the same chart as a impact, as a percentage of budget, um, the ranking would turn out different. Okay. And, and we'll have a chart showing the effect on Clown County in, in our budget, but what, what I know, like in Wakayakum County, I mean, they're very dependent uh, upon timber harvest for their in much of their budget. Um, yeah, the other, the, other, the other thing, Colleen, this is Bruce Beckett, is that um, when you go back in time when that all started, the impacts on those counties are proportionally greater when you look at all the set-asides on each, on DNR lands, as opposed to these charts, which Randy's pointing out is the disproportionate impact of just the Muralat decision. Okay, I get it. Okay. Hi, Randy. Hello. Yeah, this is Bill Peach. And um, the thing that I'd share about the slide showing impact to Clallam County is this is an opportunity for us to have a conversation with our legislators. And this is clear evidence that the legislature has helped other counties and now it's time 
to help calm panic. I agree. Uh, <laughs> we, we, I think we all agree. Such profound statements. Paul Jewell from the Washington State Association of Counties is on as well. Paul, were you trying to say something? No, I'm sorry, I wasn't. Um, I, I was working on a couple of things at one time and, and was listening in while I was speaking. So I, I apologize, I had my mute off. Um, sorry if you caught some of the conversation I was having on the side. Oh, that's all right. So I, I'm just wondering if WASAC might support an effort like that to try to, you know, in also include Clallam County in whatever goes forward. Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, that's uh, something that we're advocating for. Uh, we've worked um, to uh, put this study together. We'll be putting together a press release about it as well. Um, and uh, um, uh, we've already started incorporating it into some of the other work that DNR is working on with their trust land performance assessment. Uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner Johnson and, and uh, Commissioner Peach are both aware of that uh, too. Yeah. So, um, Clallam and Jefferson counties together support, have a steering committee that um, selects three initiatives, uh, not formal initiatives, but three topics, priorities. Uh, the group is called NOLA, the North Olympic Legislative Alliance, of which Josh Weiss is the lobbyist for this group that represents governments, nonprofits, and industries from the two counties. and we are going to select what those three topics will be that um, affect uh, our region. And um, I think this potentially might be one that is discussed as a priority. And so um, we can, I mean, it'll be up to the steering committee what they select, but this could be one of those three and uh, if that's the case, uh, we would love to have our lobbyists work with WASAC to try to get something across the finish line before the end of the next legislative session. Well, we work closely with Josh we shall, uh, with Josh on a lot of different things. So uh, just keep us up to date and we'll do everything we can to help. Great. Uh, it looks like Jim Stauffer has a comment. Yes, I was just going to uh, comment on, uh, and Matt answered it, it's the encumbered lands, which is uh, those counties down to the southwest, southeast of us that uh, were designated a long time ago as encumbered lands, and they don't have, at the end of the day, they don't have uh, um, other ways of producing revenue for their county, and then that's why they're referred to as at those encumbered, encumbered lands. Also, I will add on the, the where you've got the 28% impact to schools and, and uh, what people might not be aware of on here is that schools um, got that revenue clawed back up and which means we would receive that state forest revenue if there was a harvest in our areas but OSPI would in turn claw that back. And so it was a zero sum for, for us. And uh, one year it could be a thousand dollars. Next year it could be a hundred thousand dollars. So it's not a, um, a sustainable income for revenue for school districts. Now for the last, um, since 2017-ish, uh, we have, that whack by OSPI was overturned by OSPI and we have been receiving those and it affects 83, what are called 83 timber school districts that receive that. And this slide doesn't totally reflect that and it's, um, and that needs to be addressed or known to everybody on here. And it just, just to say that 28% uh, schools impact, um, is uh, we need that, the whole story on there. And so that's why I'm always concerned that uh, um, slides don't always reflect everything that we're getting 
that were affected by. So if that makes sense to folks. And WASDA, which is the um, Washington State School Directors Association has a trust land advisory committee in which Matt talked about, in which we work together to um, uh, um, work through all of these issues to make sure it's hopefully clear to folks. And so it's uh, pretty good work, um, but it's, yes, we could use those funds all the time. So thank you. Uh, Rod, you had some comments? Well, and it's just, it, it's always interesting, the discussion about encumbered lands and where the impacts of off-base lands are. Uh, there's a concern always when you see charts like this is that they kind of mask the impacts. Uh, at Clown County, it's a huge impact. It's even more of an impact west of the Elwha where a lot of the county trust lands are located. I believe it's almost two thirds, 60% or more. Um, and most of the impacts of a lot of these decisions in the last quarter decade, quarter century have been on, uh, on those lands. The other thing is the encumbered lands, there is always an interest like, well, maybe we should have a share of that. But I can, I can tell you, and I think Bruce and Matt and Jim could jump in here as well. We've also heard discussions like, well, if we're going to pay to, you know, offset these losses, maybe we should just look at paying to move all the lands into a different status. And it's not just revenue to the counties we should be concerned about. It should also be the issues of jobs associated with working force being turned into different type of land status. So that's the other thing about there's more to the chart than in the chart that Jim just talked about. Okay, thank and, and, you. And I agree with all of the above. Colleen, so we just quickly get through, because I did want to cover a couple other things. Would you flip ahead a couple more charts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know I Bruce had a comment as well, or had his hand oh, raised. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, what, look, thank you, Colleen. Why don't we go ahead and let Randy finish, and then I'll, I'll okay. pose my question. OK. Yeah. Go ahead, Randy. And, and I'm going, to, again, just in a, uh, to folk, keep going. Next one. I mean, keep going. And again, this is just shows the economic impact uh, process, including in-plan and Colleen would tell you, obviously in-plan doesn't measure all the effects for timber jobs, a la truck drivers aren't listed related to that, even though they are related to timber hauling. Keep going though. I just wanted, uh, this is kind of the summary of the potential average impacts uh, of the, uh, keep going one more, I think. From the HCP amendment, it, it's you uh, can read, everyone can read on the left, logging mills, pulp member uh, across all counties, 100 jobs, 11.6 million annual average income. Um, and then total impacts across uh, all counties, 220 jobs, uh, similar distribution. It, without going to it uh, again, it impacts some counties a lot more than others. Uh, obviously we've seen that, keep going. And this just uh, sum summarizes uh, the, the change in job Im impacts from just the H HCP versus interim strategy. So uh, uh, some counties impacted obviously a lot more uh, than others. Uh, Column County, we're, we were not impacted as much as others. Um, next, ne Colleen, if you wouldn't mind, go, uh, yeah, next one. Um, the other thing which was done, uh, performed by Highland Economics, which I thought was important, was uh, they wanted to look at the other ecosystem services, for lack of a better term. What were some of the other benefits or lack thereof? Can we really attribute other, other things to the change in, in the uh, harvest levels? And uh, carbon, we'll come to carbon in just a second. The thought was, oh, um, uh, California has a carbon registry. Other people are buying carbon. If you read the Wall Street Journal, you'll see that. Uh, but um, that's not likely um, as far as benefits. And uh, you know, we'll go into that. Recreation with the Delta change in this add to uh, our additional tourism. Uh, they looked at that uh, very closely. 
they couldn't see any change. Salmon fishing, unlikely to increase. Uh, reduced costs, they looked at flooding water quality. Remember, we've already set aside, we, the, the state has already set aside 600,000 acres regardless for multiple, multiple other species. So they couldn't see any real benefits relative to water quality or flooding because it's all normally in very good shape. And they said possible uh, less road damage. And they looked at that and they ended up dropping it because they didn't couldn't really uh, fathom ultimately any benefit from that. Next slide, please. I'd just like to spend about two minutes on carbon credits. Uh, and I say this because everyone's read about that. We had two prior land commissioners who suggested that we just set aside all of our forests and get paid uh, carbon credits for that. Um, and of course, forgetting about all the other jobs and everything else related to it, I guess. Um, the key about carbon, at least so far, has been it's only the incremental change. So if it's mandatory that you set aside certain lands because of the Endangered Species Act or anything else, that is not uh, something that they will pay for. It's, uh, and again, it's a voluntary market. Uh, there are certain other protocols. You have to go out and measure your trees all the time, do a lot of other things. The amount one's paid is a lot, uh, can vary quite a bit. But there was a potential and they said, let's take a look at that. But the big qualification hurdle, and I'll draw everyone's attention, the bottom line is additionality. So if there is no additionality, change in forest management required anyway, do species and habitat protections, a la that's the category where we are, uh, good luck finding someone who's gonna pay for carbon credits. And I've got to tell you, having been in, spent time looking at carbon credits and there's, it's kind of the, uh, um, the uh, financial uh, uh, darling right now for some folks, but it, uh, because of the additionality, I can't, uh, I do not believe that I can see any way that we might be able to participate. That may, might change in the future and that'd be great. Um, so next slide, please. Potential impact is small, depends, depends on uh, fuel taxes. That's just on the roads. Next slide, please, quickly. The summary is obviously one of the key things. Marble Merrillet only acres, 37,000. Harvest, 21 million feet. Stumpage revenue, 6.6. .6. Financial impact, again, over half of that to our county. Direct jobs and indirect jobs, total income, and that's kind of a, a summary and a bottom line of where we are. Um, and that's across the state, not that's just across, County. That's right. That's across the state. But please remember the dollars that were quoted at the end, half, just about half of those come from uh, out of our pockets. And my bottom line, um, and just uh, taking a look at that, uh, it's great that those of us in rural counties provide ecosystem services for people in the state, but the direct impact to rural counties is obviously disproportionate. And, uh, you know, um, I don't know how everyone feels about that, but certainly when you're trying to fund schools or you're trying to fund your county government or you're trying to fund a lot of things and it comes directly out of your hide, then it, it gets to be very, very uh, uh, expensive. So. I wanted to stop there and at least get through quickly um, everything. Um, and I know this is somewhat uh, difficult and a little bit uh, laborious, uh, but um, um, I'm open to questions. So Ed Bowen has a question, Ed. Okay, I can read his question for him. Potential impact to county roads is small question mark. How does such how does such programs as the Olympic Discovery Trail tasking of road department dollars factor into small along with other demands on the county road department in Clallam County? I, I'm not sure if I really understand then um uh entirety of what Ed's question is, when, when we said the impact to county roads, uh, when one, again, our, 
backing up. Our county is obviously a lot different than other counties in that we have a lot of income, income, I'm wearing my county hat totally here, that comes into the county coffers from sales tax and all the other things. Certainly, and part of the what we have, all of property taxes goes to roads, part of it goes to obviously our general fund. And so when one looks at, at the funding from the DNR timber harvest that goes to the road fund, it's relatively small compared to the total of their budget. That's true in our county, but it wouldn't be true if you went to Pacific County. So that's hopefully my answer or what Ed's question was. Okay. Um, and Bruce, you had a comment you wanted to make, and then we got a couple other people. Well, I just had a question for Randy and Paul. Um, first of all, thank you for the counties undertaking this. It's, just, it's good to have another you know, lens out there looking at this. Um, Randy or Paul, do you think this also, you know, begs the question that one, you have the financial impact, which clearly has to be, you know, debated or argued or, you know, hopefully reconciled uh, and help. But the second thing that seems to surface for me is uh, a couple of us went out and took a lot of photographs of Murelet habitat that was being set aside that was actually plantations. And you know, I hate to pose the age old question of, should there be a re-exam, will, will this study help, uh, you know, bring about maybe a relook at some of these acres over the long run, or, or is that not in the, um, the next steps uh, priority for the counties? Um, Paul can probably also answer that. Paul knows that's been one of my greatest bugaboos just exactly what you said, Bruce, when you go out on the land and it's in the marble Marillette habitat area and you look at it and it's a 15 year old plantation or whatever. Yeah. The, um, question of inventory validity, as I said, the DNR performed their last complete on the ground inventory in the 90s, I think it was, uh, and they've done some subsampling since then. We as a county under the trust land performance appraisal uh, are coming forward with recommendations to DNR. And I think we've highlighted just what you've said and what the, uh, the uh, DNR uh, that we've put in front of the DNR many times, which is that, you know, if you're, if you're the Weyerhaeuser of the world or the Rainiers of the world or a lot of other folks or a private company, it, almost everyone's required to put feet on the ground once every seven to 10 years. I think Port Blakely does it every seven years. We used to do it once every 10 years. So um, we need to uh, make sure that it stays in front of the DNR that they, they uh, update their inventory completely. So, and, and I totally agree with your comment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Nancy has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, just a clarification question. Does habitat conservation plan imply no harvest or is there anything in there to have a controlled harvest? Um, you're, you're, that, that's a really good question. Uh, most again, if one thinks about what habitat is and I tried to start with that with you're talking about really large trees with uh, you know big limbs on them for the habitat to meet that criteria. If we exclude the fact that, as Bruce noted, that some of their definitions of habitat aren't really habitat when one gets on the ground, but let's assume it is that. Uh, it basically would mean no harvest in those areas. Um, I saw Rod had wanted to comment on that. Well, there is some in theory, some latitude in some areas within the OESF. That's why I, I would argue it depends. <laughs> I think a, another colleague would say that in practice, um, that has meant if it's habitat, we are not going to really do much there. Rod, that's such an attorney answer. But, but Rod's correct. In the theory, <laughs> and I underline theory, is that they should be able to do something OESF, you know, and being quite honest, uh, 
you know, if one thinks about riparian areas, then the fact that you can theoretically go in and thin those areas, but being honest, looking over a period of time and watching areas, they have thinned a few areas, but not very many. Most of the time, it's a, it's a uh, more difficult to to accomplish the the thinning than I think what the net revenue is. Plus, it takes a lot of people to go in and mark that. So. Um, so I'm um, back to Rod's answer is probably absolutely correct. As an attorney in practice, it probably doesn't happen. Okay, it's 8.57. Did, did we get through all the slides here? I'm not, yes, it looks like we did. Um, okay. Uh, so just so everyone knows, we'll have the recording up on our website, chooseclalumfirst.com, and uh, also these slides will be there. And does anyone have any additional questions they want to ask of Randy or uh, I know Bill's on as well, Commissioner Peach? Um, or any of these other folks that work on these issues in Olympia regularly. Oh, it looks like we have one in the chat. Nope, that's just a thank you, good. Um, so if not, Randy, do you have any closing remarks you wanna add? No, I, I, I first of all, I, I appreciate the fact that the Washington Association of the County stepped up and did the study. I also appreciate, as I said earlier, it gives us a, a tool when trying to evaluate anything in the future that comes along relative to what effect it might have on counties. And uh, we haven't always had that available to us. So I'm very appreciative of the fact that DNR helped to uh, step up and perform this. And being quite honest, we couldn't have finished the study without not only Benson, Bruce and Gerard, but with uh, close uh, work uh, and input from the DNR. So again, everyone who's involved in the study, I appreciate. Uh, it probably told a lot of us things that we already knew, which is there's, there were some disproportionate effects, certainly uh, as Rod highlighted on, on some west uh, parts of our junior taxing districts, western parts of Colum County. Uh, but again, we didn't really know until we took a look at it. So um, thank you very much. So one thing I'd like to add is that, I mean, just this is a really good piece of data to show that there's a problem that, you know, there's a disproportionate impact that exists. But if NOLA and Wasac are going to advocate for something, there has to be a solution proposed and that is potentially palatable when our uh, you know, the Ways and Means Chair uh, in the Senate doesn't want funds pulled from uh, the state general fund. So how do we go about addressing this issue? And maybe it is just a monetary ask, but I know we've got some pretty smart folks that work on these issues regularly. Maybe there's a creative way to address this. I don't know. You're in the room, uh, you're in the realm of Bruce's uh, area of expertise, there's no doubt. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh -huh. Just a straight monetary ask will be challenging, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have a quick answer for you, Colleen. I, I wonder if DNR could purchase some lands that could be harvested equivalent to the amount that was taken out of each county where it wouldn't be part of a habitat conservation plan, something along those lines. So it's yeah, not an every year uh, asking for funds from the state. And I see Jim, you've got your hand up. Jim? Um, yes, that, that is always part of the discussion and DNR does look at other potential harvest lands. Um, I think, one other point I want like to make is that common school trust lands is just not about trees. Um, you know, we we actually have a parking lot in downtown Seattle, which produces revenue. Um, it was an agreement about a hundred years ago, and uh, we get very little. It'd be good to see a high rise 
with that increase of that property tax on that, which would um, uh, provide greater revenue. But we also, Common Schools also has some vineyards, some water, some graze, uh, grant, uh, grazing land on the east side. And so um, it's just not about trees and you got to think of the other potential investments. But DNR does, it's part of the legislative process that if they look at um, purchasing land that and transfer uh, between that is higher producing. Um, we did one where there was a chunk of land here that was sold. It's uh, over near you, Colleen, off of on Anderson Road. And it was sold in real estate. And then that the money from that was used to purchase some other land that was higher producing um, in, uh, over in Skagit County. The offsite reservoir is another good, very good example that is, you know, between the county and uh, city of Squim um, for that Dungeness offsite reservoir. It wasn't, that area wasn't producing. And so it was deemed to be a, um, a better resource by having a, that reservoir there. And so whenever the county was able to finally uh, fund all of that to buy it all, then the common schools will receive approximately $2 million um, to that account. And the other portion of that common school, and it kind of maybe answers um, Ed Bowen's um, question, um, but, but that takes, a, it takes a, that, super, that super majority to access those. And I think all in all, we'd like to see that changed or as Superintendent Reichdell is proposing, um, allowing the, funds to stay in the particular district, but that, that means a constitutional change too, which is a heavy lift. So yeah, very high bar. be done. Yep. Okay. Thank well, thank you everyone. I'm going to stop the recording. Um,